and then we'll sing. We're going to sing it slightly slower than probably what everyone's used to. So today we're going to continue in our sermon series in Philippians, and we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4, and in, partic in particular, um, I think it's about four very impactful verses. Now over the course of this series, we've learned a couple of things. Let's refresh our memories. We've learned the way the Trinity helps us to form strong relationships and a strong church community. Paul gave some real-life examples of things that can hinder that process, like grumbling and arguing. He also helped us to overcome such issues by remembering not what we are feeling, but who we are. If we know that we are children of God and belong to Christ, this should help us to respond and act in a way that reflects who we represent, Jesus himself. Last week we learned that Paul warns against legalism and lawlessness, that instead we are to follow the law of Christ Jesus, in whom the law is fulfilled 
and who is the only one to ever perfectly follow it. We've also discovered in Philippians that one of the common uh, trends that Paul talks about is this concept of joy. It's come up quite a few times. And so it's not surprising really that we start there again this morning. So if you have your Bibles, join me now with um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, we all know this one. We've learned this at nursery, uh, nursery school, at Sunday school. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. Now, this is not just a small measure of joy either. The word rejoice is defined as great joy or delight. It is joy that cannot be contained inside of your person. And so it comes out in a physical expression for all to see. If the word rejoice could be measured, it would be joy overflowing. Now, in the last week of the school holidays, um, Rudolph and Xavier, as you know, went tramping in the bush for three days. Now, in order to survive, they had to carry all that they needed inside a backpack on their shoulders. In order to get where they were going, they needed to pack some essential items. A sleeping bag, clothes for every type of weather, because you don't want to get caught in the New Zealand bush without warm clothes. If the weather changes suddenly, it very quickly becomes a matter of life or death. They needed food and a camping stove to cook it on and to boil water. They needed a map, a compass, a first aid kit, even a personal locator beacon. So many necessities, but there's one problem. It all needs to fit in one small bag, and it shouldn't weigh more than your body weight can carry. Even um, then, it works out to be approximately 10%, um, am I right, of your body weight? Between 10 and 20%, which actually is still quite heavy if you think about it, right? Uh, walking for three days for long periods of time carrying a too heavy backpack would be torture. There would be no rejoicing there. The pack needs to contain the right balance of things that you need in order to feel at peace with the journey ahead. Peace knowing you can actually accomplish it. Today we're going to learn the things we need to pack in our backpacks as we continue on our journey of faith. Things that will give us peace for the journey. The verse we're going to look at is a very popular one, quoted many times. It talks about the peace of God that passes all understanding. And I reckon most of us know that, but off by heart, and we've quoted it several times to ourselves and to others. Now, before you look at that verse, can you tell me what are the essential items a Christian needs to put in their backpack to attain such a peace? If... If you've read my newsletter, there's a little clue in that. A Bible, someone said, yeah? Anything else? Yes, you can see there's a, a well-seasoned tramper there. <laughs> Anything else? Faith, good, good. Prayer, yes. So it's interesting that we all have our different ideas about what we think would go in our backpack. But I wondered if you realized that in the verses prior and after this particular phrase, there's some lessons in there that we often forget. And then we might find that we actually don't have peace. We're in the midst of the battle, and it doesn't appear that we're making progress. Something is missing. Has God forgotten us? We may feel a whole variety of things, but peace may not be one of those things. So today I want to suggest that if we want this peace that passes all understanding, then we have to take in the lessons that surround this particular verse. So let's take a look at it now, and we're going to unpack it slowly. 
um, and see where it leads us. A peace that will not only trans transcend all of our understanding, but the scripture says it will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, here's my challenge for the young people today. So here's the backpack. As you're listening to the sermon, I want you to write in there some of the things that you need that the scripture tells us that will help us to get that peace. Good? Awesome. Right. So let's continue to read the scripture. We'll start. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't remember thinking about gentleness when I'm thinking about this peace that passes all understanding. Hey, it's not something we've taken in. But let's look and see what it says. So the first word that comes up, gentleness. Gentleness means to be kind, to be reasonable towards one another, to consider the needs of others. The command is to be gentle to all, not some, all people. And the reason we are told this is because the Lord is near. Even though we can't see him, Jesus is near to us. His spirit dwells within us. So he's in us and he's watching. How will we respond to the situations that we face? He wants us to make the right choices when we act. He wants us to represent him. Remember when we looked at Paul's warning against arguing and grumbling? Remember we said it was not good for us to be controlled by our feelings. Instead, in those times, God calls us to act on the basis of who we are. So who are we? Children of God. It's much better if we remember who we are and act gently towards each other because Jesus is near. It's also important to know that there's another and equally dynamic reason why the Lord is near. He is near to those who are hurting. A picture I like to use in my mind as a reminder is to envision the person in front of you with Jesus standing behind them with his hand resting on their shoulder. How might that change the way we respond to people? God is a compassionate God, the author of peace himself. He wants to come in and heal the hurts of people. The Lord is near not only to keep us accountable, but also to bring healing and restoration, to give us joy because he has compassion for those who are suffering. The next command in those verses of scripture are, is, do not be anxious. To be anxious means you are filled with worry, anxiety. You're concerned about the future. I wonder if you've ever noticed that there's an antidote to joy. Do you know what that is? It's worry. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. The more we worry, the less likely we are to rejoice. But let's be honest, it's hard not to worry. <laughs> it's hard not to feel anxious. It seems almost impossible to get rid of that awful feeling at times. It's almost like we need someone to rescue us from the situation, to give us advice on how to solve our problems. But we must not lose hope. There's a powerful antidote to worry. Do you know what it is? It's Jesus. Jesus. Yes, bravery comes into it, but Jesus. When we turn our eyes on Jesus, we realize that he is God. And all-knowing, he already knows what is going to happen and how we will come through our trials. We can trust him because he is a God who is not far away, but a God who is near. When we hurt, he hurts. 
He wants to bring us healing and restore our joy. And Paul has learned this through his own personal experience. If anyone had reason to lose hope, Paul was that person. No one is immune. Not even pastors are immune for such things. We all struggle to find peace at times. But Paul found a solution through his experience. He knew it was hard to find oneself in such a state and to feel like God wasn't there. And how do you get yourself out of that? Well, it seems God revealed to Paul some practical ways to step out of that frame of mind and place his trust in Christ. And so through experience, he advises the Philippians, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present ah, lost my space, sorry, present your requests to God. In every situation, this probably means that in everything we should be praying. Not just when we are feeling anxious. We should make prayer a part of our DNA every day. In the morning, pray. In the afternoon, pray. In the evening, pray. Pray without ceasing. At every task, pray. At any sign of trouble, pray. As you're going through the thick of things, pray. How is your prayer life at the moment? Turn your focus away from your problems, the things that are making you anxious, and turn your eyes to Jesus. Tell him what you're going through, and you will find the comfort you need. And prayer is not just a conversation. Paul writes, by prayer and petition. He separates out petition. It's not only good to tell God our problems, it's good and right to ask him to help. Petition means to ask, to request. Think of it like this. Have you ever been asked to sign your name to a list about something important? What is it called? A petition. So it's a collection of names that is used to convince those in authority that you need their help to change something important. So ask God for the change you need, as he is the one who has authority over all things, even the ability to miraculously bring to, li to right all that we are troubled with. He is also not a God we need to beg for solutions. He is a God who encourages us that he is there <clears throat> and he is listening. Ask and you shall receive, the Bible says. God is patient too. He doesn't get tired of hearing us talk about what's going on with us. And it's because of this that we should approach him with gratitude. Paul reminds us to approach God in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, the verse says. Thank you for who you are, Jesus. Like obedience, thanksgiving must come not out of obligation, but out of gratitude to God. If we do these things, then Paul assures us that the peace which passes all understanding will come. So today, ask yourself as you continue on your journey, what is missing from my faith backpack at the moment. Now I also want to add that God's peace is different from the world's peace. The world's peace is usually solution driven at any cost. God's peace is needs driven and considers what is moral. His will is always to provide for us in a way that is good and right, in line with his character. And sometimes that means we get a no to our request. God has something better in mind. Our creator knows who we are. He knows what we need better than anyone else. But sometimes we are desperate for answers and they don't come. What do you do then? 
Well, there are two aspects to God's peace that I want to cover. The first is this concept of shalom. Have you heard shalom before? It's the Hebrew for peace. Well, when we read scripture, often the definition for the word peace that comes to mind for us is the world's definition. It's no wonder then that we feel disappointed at times when we don't get what we asked for. God has never promised to solve all of our problems, and so perhaps we have a misguided expectation of him. That is why I want to teach you about God's peace. His definition, most, more commonly known as shalom, is quite different. So in the future, when you read peace, I want you to think shalom. Shalom is not only a, the solution to problems. It actually means all-round well-being and wellness. Well-being of mind, person, emotion, and spirit. It's much broader and deeper than the world's understanding of peace. It's more holistic. Holistic is the belief that the parts of something are all interconnected and can only be explained if you look at the whole um, picture. The world's understanding of peace is limited. It's a half-filled backpack. We need to learn what a full backpack looks like. So what should we pack in our backpack? Well, we need food for nourishment. And I think, Jean, you said the Bible. Excellent. That goes in our backpack. And praying. Being in relationship with God is our nourishment. Like the clothes in a backpack, we need physical solutions to physical problems. God is all about that, too. Like the map and compass, we need to know where we are going. We need wisdom and discernment. We need many things to come together to feel the peace that passes all understanding. And more importantly than anything, we need that personal locator beacon. You know why? So that God can come to our aid when there's no one around to rescue us. We need a deep and wide peace, an all-of-life peace. Every aspect of ourselves, we need shalom, not worldly peace. But what about those situations where peace doesn't feel complete and we feel like we haven't arrived at the fullness of it? We've done everything right, and yet we don't have enough peace and joy, it seems, to actually rejoice. Well, Paul writes not only about a peace that will pass all understanding, but a peace that will guard our hearts and our minds. I find that so interesting. God's peace not only comes to our aid in the form of shalom, but it is also a God. So the next question that follows then is, how does peace guard our hearts and minds? Well, I think when there's nothing to hold on to, when nothing makes sense, we can only do one thing, to trust in the one whose peace passes all understanding, whose ways are higher than ours, who can be trusted because he isn't a God who is removed from us, but one who is near. So near, in fact, he died on the cross. He's always reaching out, never stops loving. A God who is ever gracious and merciful. If you know where your peace comes from, then you realize it's going to be okay. Because you have him. And you might not know what he will do or when he will do it, but you know Jesus is the solution. Have you ever heard the expression, it's not what you do, it's who you know? If there's ever a more true sense of that statement, it's in Christ. Jesus is the peace that passes all understanding, and he is the one you can entrust your heart and mind to. God is a good, good father, and you are his. Let us pray. God of peace, we thank you, Lord, 
that you come near to us. In the midst of life, Lord, you are present with us. You rejoice with us. And you hurt with us, God. You long to bring restoration, fullness of joy. You long for us to see your shalom. You also understand, Lord, how hard it is for us. And the many trials we face and all the things that life throws at us, Father. But I pray in those moments we would hear you speak clearly, telling us you love us, not to give up, to continue to hope that you have the solution, that we don't need to see it to know it's there. And so you guard our hearts, God, and we are so grateful. I pray that you'd reach every one of us here this morning, Lord. Speak to us deeply in the things we need to learn, Lord. Some of us, if not all of us, Lord, have been carrying a backpack that is half full. There are things we need to be doing, Lord, to ensure that we can journey on. Help us to know what those things are for us. Thank you, gracious God, that you provide for our every need. I pray your peace upon us all today. In Jesus' name, amen.
nosso lugar e 